on. And, you know, and what I'm trying to get at here is the sovereignty of the people. If there's, if there's one thing that I want everybody to walk out of here with at the end of the day is that you're supposed to be in charge. The government, government is supposed to be subordinate to you. It is supposed to do your will, at least as a body politic. Dan? Yes. We, many of the people in this room I recognize from the vote where we said let the people vote and the civil unions and they ignored us, dissed us, and just made right. the legislation what it is without any opportunity for the majority of us to vote. How do we overturn something like that? You elect that's different legislators. That's, that's and the repeal it. Yeah. Well, right. You can, re you can, re you can repeal the uh, uh, civil unions bill as it sits anyway I mean and there is action as we know going forward to make it less uh, less beneficial to a particular segment of society well but I'm not I think what, I, what you're asking what I was thinking about too is not on this specific issue but if the legislature is supposed to be bound by the Constitution and they violate the Constitution in terms of making bills our only redress can't be electing another legislature there has to be a direct um, well, the constitutional watchdog. I mean, and, and well, the constitutional watchdog. The, the cons judiciary. Who is supposed to be the constitutional watchdog? That's a good question. Yeah. Who is supposed to be the constitutional well, watchdog? It's supposed to be the people, but okay. not, not people don't take classes like this. Well, I mean, well, that, but I that's I what, that, what I agree too. Is what? Where is our redress if it's the legislature themselves are violating the constitution? Okay. Where is your redress? That's a good question. You know, they put it in here. We have Article Thirty-Two. 31 and 32. Well, 31, 32. <laughs> I get them down. Well, that's where the answer is. <laughs> okay. So let's. Oh, that's all right. That's part two. Part oh, one. I know. I was. What, what I was looking at. I was about to look at Article 30, but just didn't. Okay. So, why do we meet? The legislature shall assemble for the redress of public grievances. Mm -hmm and that we're making such laws as the public good may require. Now, what are public grievances? So I went back and I, I did some, some research at the State Library because we have a 1780 dictionary there, and I also went to Webster's 1828 dictionary, which in some regards is more complete uh, because I found that some words weren't defined in the 1780 dictionary. Uh, but public really means that which pertains to the whole. Now that's construed by people to say, well, that then you can only hear grievances that refer to the whole body of the state. But if you look at what they were doing in the first 35 years of our republic, you find something very different. They were responding to the grievances of individual people. So what would, could public grievances mean? It would mean grievances perpetrated by the public upon individuals, the government. So we have, that's our first purpose for meeting. Again, do we think that given the analysis that the order of legislative, <coughs> executive, judicial is arbitrary or does it have an order? We're, we, are, we assemble to redress public grievances and enact laws. Do we think that the or, our order is arbitrary or is there a first and a second purpose? There's also a bit of logic there. If you're, if what you're really doing in large part is responding to public grievances, sometimes a law may be the most appropriate response, and sometimes it might not be. So you would only respond to a public grievance with a law when that was the appropriate response, which is one of the things we've lost. And then we look at Article 32. The people have a right to an orderly in an orderly and peaceable manner to assemble and consult upon the public common good and give instructions to their representatives. You know, you could maybe put on a uh, 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 town ballot an order to your representatives, or you might even be able to call a meeting in your town to address a particular question before the legislature and discuss and vote and give your legislator, your representative, an instruction, which he would be at least quasi-bound to follow. Not absolutely, because he has to deal with what he finds out in the process and things may change radically. 
but then he would also have to explain to you why he didn't follow your instruction. And he may have some good reason. But I think uh, but Shalom's uh, well, point let, here let, is... Well, let's continue. And to request to the legislative body by way of petition, that's written, or remonstrance, that's spoken, redress for the wrongs done them and the grievances they suffer. You have an absolute right to go before the legislature, or to have put before the legislature would be a better way to put it. Your request to have a wrong done you redressed. How do we know that this was the action that was done, that, that individual wrongs were addressed? First of all, we go back to the journal and we find that people are restored to their law frequently. The other thing is uh, Article 7 in the second part of the Constitution, which occurred in 17, they, that was incorporated in 1792. It is generally not understood. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion online about it as to what exactly is meant. But it's, if you go back historically to find out when they put it in and why, it suddenly makes sense. Let's see if I can find your article. So, well, while you're looking at it, I, 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 I requested, well, not mine. I requested oh. specifically three times uh, in the last two months we'll get there. Of, of my senator a position statement on a specific issue, and he has ignored completely all three, leaving me to presume that my only redress is the next election. That is probably correct. And that's, I think, that was the thrust of your question. What, but, you what know, else do we have, ultimately? Well, I go back to annual elections. But let me, let, let's look at Article 7. No member of the general court shall take fees, be of counsel, or act as advocate in any cause before either branch of the legislature, and upon due proof thereof, such member shall forfeit his seat in the legislature. Why was that put in? Because between 1784 and 1792, legislators, in order to supplement their in income, were taking fees for the introduction of redress of grievances. So we know they did it, <laughs> because the people could create offense to them taking uh, money for doing so. So if for the first, say, 35 years that the legislator, the legislature met, they spent half or more of their time redressing grievances, restoring people to their law, and today that's done about 0% of the time. Absolutely. Well, can you give some examples? Because I have no idea what you mean when you say there was a, a, a grievance that was redressed and the guy was restored to his law. Okay, but sure. I can't remember the name, but um, one case I read was a woman who, she had gone back to England, or had gone to England, and during the uh, time that she was in England, somebody had died, and her case had gone to probate, and been settled in probate before she had ever received notice or had any ability to give back and lay claim to the estate. And so she went to the legislature seeking to be restored to her law because she had lost the estate without due process. The legislature said, you know what? You're right. And in fact, the party who had received the estate said, yep, you're right. And so the legislature said, do over. And there was a do-over, and she got the estate to which she was rightly entitled. So the legislature overturned basically a court case. Yes. Now, That's why it's called a general court. The general court created all other courts, so the legislature is the general court. So this, this was the practice. This is also, Parliament still serves as the general court of England. Again, this came from their paradigm. This is, the, this is what they saw as a reasonable action of the legislature. Now, the, in, uh, in 1819, when the court, when the judiciary, I try not to use that word for the court, I try to say the word judiciary, make a, a distinction. When they came up with, in Sherburn versus Merrill, that you didn't have a right to uh, be restored to your law because this was an improper commingling of powers, um, what was I going to say? They, um, they were ignoring, or they were asking you to believe that those who wrote and ratified and practiced the Constitution for the first 35 years of the Republic 
didn't understand what they had written and ratified. And that's a total absurdity. You, you, can't, you can't get there from here. I mean, it's, it's just absurd. Going back to this change in the makeup of the state senate, yep. the basis under which they were elected, why didn't some citizen in New Hampshire take a look at this and say, as a citizen, I have standing before the Supreme Court of New Hampshire. I'll challenge that. Well, I don't believe it was. First of all, it was done by constitutional amendment. This was put before okay. the people, and the people right. voted it. Why they rolled over and played dead without any challenge by somebody saying this wasn't didn't comply with federal guidelines or whatever, I, I shall never know. If it's a constitutional amendment, okay, that, that's what that. it is. But let's assume that it that something of significant change along those lines that occurred not as a result of the constitutional amendment, that the Senate and the House had determined that that's the way they wanted to do it. They did. The governor they signed can't. it. They can't. Okay. They can't because the manner in which senatorial districts were determined was a matter of constitution. Forgetting about the senatorial districts, this is about width of roads or, well, that's a good example of it. Something that clearly is contrary to the Constitution, but that everybody wants to do. Would someone, would, a, would an individual citizen have standing before the Supreme Court here in New Hampshire to go to... I don't know, but let's, say, let's back up a bit. Let's back up a bit. If it's a matter of constitutional right, and we see, okay, first of all, what's a public grievance? A public grievance is a complaint that you have against the government, right? That's, that's, what, that's what we just analyzed. That's what a public grievance is. The legislature has jurisdiction over public grievances. Okay. Well, wait. Okay. What, what article of the Constitution gives the judiciary jurisdiction over public grievance? If None. If you want, if you if you have a complaint that something is unconstitutional, do you want that to go before the body over which you have zero control, or do you want that to go before the body over which you have the greatest control? Okay, but let's look at hate crimes, for example, because we touched on it earlier. Yeah. Let's assume that there was legislation before the New Hampshire legislature that was passed to promote hate crime. There is. Fine. There, we have we have hate crimes legislation. Yeah. We have well, hate crimes RSAs. Okay. What's to prevent a citizen from? I mean, obviously redress is great. But, you know, it's sort of a big process. I mean, there's a lot of heavy lifting. There is involved. nothing to prevent it. There is nothing to prevent it. Diane Gilbert has gone to court over uh, her uh, school board uh, sending home advocacy pieces in okay. stuff That's published. Okay. And it has floated up to the Superior Court, to the State Supreme Court, and now it's going to the U.S. Supreme Court. Greater question is, and she is now in complete agreement with this, is the judiciary doesn't have jurisdiction. Why are you going before them? Thank you. Because you already got a loss here. I mean, but, you're sitting there on the wrong side of this thing. But so you go. Okay, I'll throw the long ball. It'll cost me some money. But where are we going to go? But if, if you go before the legislature, which uh, you have an absolute legal. right to. It cost you nada. Yeah, but by the same token, I mean we got a guy over here who's writing letters all day long. All he's doing, <laughs> but is he's but he's not system. going before the legislature. And why isn't he going before the legislature? I got a question. I, I've been aggrieved by by my government. How do I go before the legislature? Okay, now this is a great question. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you know you're supposed to be. <laughs> okay, now why can't you? Well, let's. Look back in history a little bit. First of all, in 1819, the judiciary exempted themselves from redress of grievances, and the people bought it. Foolishly, they bought it. It's good to be the king. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then, in 1925, prior in 1921, we had still had laws on the books that said if someone or some corporate body, i.e., a town, is party to a uh, redress of grievance, i.e., they're the objective. They have aggrieved somebody or some individual agent in government, the uh, commissioner of health and human services, whatever. This is how you have to notify them so that they'll, so that they'll know to come to the public hearing and defend themselves. That's 1921. 
1925. The laws are recodified between 1921 and 1925. They simply didn't include it in the recodification. It was never repealed. So, so the exemption. Notify them or the fact that you could do it? The fact that you had to notify them. So the exemption wasn't a constitutional change? No. Well, now, then the exemption ought to be unconstitutional. Well, cool. yeah. Now, in 1963, well, prior to 1963, all legislators submitted their own legislation. They wrote it out, typed it out, whatever, and handed it to the speaker and said, I want this bill to come in. In 1963, we created legislative services. Those are the people that draft our bills for us and make sure that all, all, lawyers. <laughs> all the areas of law that are impinged by some idea are touched, <clears throat> are corrected, made consistent. They are empowered to write bills and resolves, and orders since orders should be treated like resolves. Missing from that list is petitions. And therefore, they tell me they cannot write petitions. I tried last session and got rebuffed. I have a bill in to tell them that yes, you can write petitions and to recreate the statutes that say how you are to notify somebody that they are a party to a redress agreement. But the reason you can't do it is because you can't do it. There is no mechanism by which to seek a redress of grievance by the body that is properly empowered to hear such redress. So it's, life's not fair and that's the way it is, huh? At the moment, yes. Because your, your, your legislators have... By ignorance or by intent, and I, it's 1963, and therefore I cannot presume, though I have my own opinions, denied you the mechanism to seek redress, and have left you, and the court, I guess, in some degree, has rightly opened up that venue, because you have to have a redress of grievance, but it's by a body that doesn't have jurisdiction, and over which you have no control. And if you are dissatisfied with the result, tough. So what are the practical implications? Should, should this bill be signed off by the governor and entered back into statute? What are the practical implications for the random Joe citizen? He could then approach his, his representative or senator and say, I've been wronged thusly by the state in some way, shape, or form, whether it is the state itself or one of the political subdivisions thereof, school district, town, uh, county, county attorney, uh, I mean, the, the police officer, teacher, uh, and have that wrong go before the legislature. And it's important because, I mean, one in the class, high school class I'm teaching, a uh, woman was referring to how in the early 90s that uh, she had seen people denied due process in court. The judge didn't follow the law. Now, one of the things that you hear is, well, we have citizen bills, you know, constituent bills, but sometimes a bill, a change to the law, or the creation of a new law, is not an appropriate response. Because if the problem is, is that a judge or a police officer isn't following the law, which is good, there's no change in the law to correct that. Well, what about a, a law to hold such to make it a crime to do that. You know what? That law is already on the books. <laughs> RSA 643-1. I'll simplify it, but basically those acting under the color of the law, color of law or failing to do that which is reasonably expected of their office are guilty of a misdemeanor. Well, a misdemeanor. Well, it would... How would you like to be the judge recommending the appointment of somebody who is guilty of a misdemeanor of denying due process? How would I like to be a judge of what? How would you like to be a, a, a governor nominating for appointment yeah. a judge who was guilty of a misdemeanor for denying due process? Think that would fly very far? 
Well, I was, yeah, I mean, obviously it wouldn't be appointing him anyway, but that's not the point. But, 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 but my point is, is once you have somebody convicted, police officer, how many police officers do you think will be appointed who have been once or repeatedly convicted of official oppression? That's the name of the crime. Maybe not many, but with a, if it were a felony, you wouldn't have any. Be careful with felonies. Felonies. Well, I'd fel like to be careful with felonies, but they're felonies all, have all over the place. Apparently. Felonies have extensive implications. That's correct. I agree with that. And, and I think there I should would, be fewer of them than there are. But and apparently. I would be loath to deny anybody the right to protect themselves if or the power. A, if you're a public, a, I'm not saying a public official can defend himself. He could if he were accused of something. That no, 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 no. If he's convicted of a felony. Neither he nor anybody in his family can own a firearm. I understand yeah. that. And that is why I would be loath to do it. Yeah, okay, but if he's the guy in charge... And if he's but the he's no longer in charge. He's been convicted of a misdemeanor. In fact, I'd have to check, but I bet it's unlawful for somebody who's been convicted of a misdemeanor to hold such office. I know you can't run... As a matter of fact, I know it is because if you mess with anybody's signs... That's a misdemeanor, and you can't hold elected office in the state of New Hampshire. Okay. So, a sheriff is elected office. Excuse my ignorance on this, but I'm not from New Hampshire originally. What exactly is an RSA? RSA is a revised statute okay. annotated. It's, it's, it's the law. current embodiment of our law. Every so often, we go through and we clean up the law laws and we give them a new name. So an RSA is a reinterpretation of a law that was already in the it's Constitution? A, no, it, an RSA is one of our current body of law. Either relatively recent, I don't know when RSAs were done, I think in the 70s. But it is, a, it is either a new law or a law that was, they went through it. When, when they approve, our, each recodification has to be approved by the legislature as well. But what they do is they go to it and they, they try to make sure that all of the different parts of the law agree with one another. That you don't end up with inconsistencies in the law, which you can because we go through and we modify this paragraph here and that paragraph there. Now that we have legislative services who are, you know, up to here in the law and they try to catch those inconsistencies, but they're still not perfect. Nobody is. So um, basically, we, the, the laws. I mean, every bill that they pass, if it's something new, if it makes a new RSA with a new number inserted where it belongs in the current RSAs. An administrative so, organization of the bills passed. Right. The I mean, and, and there's some there's some uh, great errors in the in our statutes right now. Right. Oh, go ahead. No, I was in hopes you'd address the difference between the not now, seals. not now, and uh, what they represent. But more, more important is that, where was I going? Um, statutes. statutes. Uh, yes. We have, some, we, 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 have some, we have some gross, inappropriate things in our, in our statutes. Yeah. Uh, not, in, not, not in what's there, but how it's shown. Beginning about 75 years ago, we ceased to present proper nouns as proper nouns, i.e. with capitals. You capitalize the first letter of your name, right? Because it's a proper noun. You capitalize the G in governor because it's a proper noun. We don't. This led to all kinds of mischief. Uh, it allowed the, whether intentional or happenstance, uh, in f fact, we no longer swear an oath to uphold the Constitution of the state. The name of the state is presented in the Constitution. The first letter of each of the name of the state, the state of New Hampshire, is capitalized. Beginning in about 75 years ago, uh, they started presenting the name in that article, the name of the state, in all caps, and Corporate in other state. and in and in other places, they uh, dropped the capital in S in state altogether, and it's presented as lowercase which makes it the condition of New Hampshire, which is <laughs> questionable. Um, so we swear, an, we, we swear an oath to uphold the condition, the constitution of the condition of New Hampshire, literally. 
Uh, now, we all believe we swear an oath to uphold the Constitution of the state, and I believe for the most part we all have that intent. But, so morally it's there, but strictly legally it's not there. It, we, they just began to no longer present Constitution, legislature, state, uh, governor, senator, all those things that you would normally capitalize and are capitalized. Are, I have taken the liberty of capitalizing them in this version of the people's liberty. Our amendments, well, let me, amendments after 1925, I, it coincides eerily with when uh, that recodification, that uh, uh, the redress. the redress of grievances was dropped, notification that you were a party. Uh, all the amendments since then, things aren't capitalized, nor are they capitalized in our law. Uh, the General Court of New Hampshire has a very specific name. Again, all first letters capitalized. General Court of New Hampshire. In all our statutes, state, general court, are not capitalized. What do they refer to? I do, you know, I mean, that's something that's got to be corrected. Um, I, I'm sure that Bill Gardner, when, you know, when we go through and I present to him the fact that uh, all the proper nouns are supposed, supposed to be capitalized, they will be capitalized, all the ones that can be. We can't go through and, and capitalize ones that the people didn't capitalize, but we certainly go through and capitalize the ones they did. Um, can the Secretary of State do that by fiat and just do it? Well, no, he can't. Because, But what he can do is look at the Constitution of 1792 and say, these words are supposed to be capitalized. They've been improperly lowercase. That he can do by fiat. And if he chooses, no, oh, that he can do. Okay. That he can do. That's lawful. That's lawfully what should be done. Right. Which will make the places that things aren't capitalized <coughs> look very bizarre. Yeah, but then it'd be right for somebody like you to offer legislation that would change that. Yeah, well, you can't do it by legislation. It must be done by constitutional amendment because you're dealing with the Constitution and two-thirds of the people must approve it, which would be a very hard... Even for that, that would seem to be pretty uncontroversial. It'll be hard to be, it'll hard to make it'll be hard to make people believe that it's necessary in this well, day. But how did it change from capitalized to uncapitalized constitution? They did it. Amendment wasn't capitalized. They did it. They just they just ceased to represent things with capitals. And they can and they can and they can redo it, but just not where it wasn't originally the case. That's right. But how they represent them only implies the meaning, but the meaning has to be the original. So whatever they suggest to us it means, it still means what it originally meant. Yeah. 50 years no. ago. If people, if, if people know that. Yeah. yeah. Okay? And part of what happens is you start making these little changes, these surreptitious changes, and people start to lose the connection. It's really what happened. If you look at, again, 1819, what is significant about 1819? Well, who, okay, who, how many here know who John Langdon was? Okay, John Langdon was one of the three men who organized the raid on Fort William and Mary, in which we captured the shot and powder for um, the Battle on Bunker Hill. He then, under the new legislature, was uh, elected to, uh, a representative and Speaker of the House. He held the position of Speaker throughout most, if not all, of the uh, War for Independence. He was organizer of the Constitutional Conventions and uh, President Pro Tem of the first convention. Uh, he then, under the new Constitution of 1784, in 1785 and 6, he became uh, President of the state. Obviously, he was elected to state senator. And then he had to, um, then he resigned that to go down to Congress to be a member of the convention for the uh, Constitution for the United States of America. Under that new Constitution, he came back. He, he was one of the leading Federalists arguing for the ratification. He became elected state sen uh, U.S. Senator, one of the first two U.S. Senators from New Hampshire, and President Pro Tem of the Senate, and swore in General Washington. After serving, I think, two terms in uh, Washington, he came back 
and was again elected a state senator, and then after that, governor of the state. And he was governor of the state during the War of 1812. 1813, he retired from politics because his wife died. 1819, he died. Now, is it particularly important that he died in the 1819? No. But what you do see is that he was 35 when the Revolutionary War began. He dies in 1819. What we're seeing is we, is the departure of those who understood the government from public service. And then in 1816 and 1818, we see the rapid reversals of the legislature wiping out legislative institutional memory, and they in turn wiped out the judiciary, wiping out judicial institutional memory. So by 1819, we have a completely different government. Would this be important? Except that they obviously didn't fulfill Article 6 in its original intent and wording, which was, as we saw, evangelical principles being essential to uh, good government and uh, providing the great security. That is what authorized the legislature to create schools. What evangelical principle? Teach your children the way that they should go and they shall not depart from it. They obviously did not teach their progeny well enough the evangelical principles, the principles of their government for the process to carry on. That was the main failing. If they had, if, if Article 6 had been sufficiently carried out, and another, you know, all these weird little ties. In the Constitution, until 1871, you had to be a Protestant to hold high office, senator, representative, or governor, slice president, or a school teacher. Why was that important? Because they wanted to ensure that evangelical principles be taught. What was the principal competing faith? Roman Catholicism, which had a hierarchical form of gov government. It wasn't arbitrary, it wasn't mean, it was that we want to make sure that the people who are teaching the children understand self-government. Okay, well, Episcopalianism was defined as a uh, Protestant. I understand. Well, government is the art of compromise. A large fraction of those... Okay. John Langdon, but you got to remember, these people, yeah, they were Anglicans, right? That's Some true. Are. But, um, you know, those were Church of England. Yeah. But they were also deeply ingrained in American culture. And American culture had originally risen up, particularly in the North, from Pres Pres Presbyterians, Presbyterians yeah. Puritans, Congregationalists, who were the evangelical persuasion and had a, a ground-up government view. And so even, and, and well, and even in the South, the Southern states were Anglican states. But even so, there was that spirit of independence and self-government that existed here that didn't exist in England. And that was what they were so intent on propagating and failed to. So intent that they put it in the Constitution, at least in a veiled form. But, you know, when, when we took those terms out by 1960, we had no idea what they I'll tell you how, how I originally arrived at that. It was my argument against, uh, it was, well, it was my argument in favor of the marriage amendment, which I based upon up until 1968, we had, our government had evangelical standards as the standard for public morality and piety. And while that is a, a view on government, it also carries with it certain societal values, which would not include same-sex marriage. When the people made that, approved that amendment in 1968, they had no idea what they were admitting as a possibility, rightly or wrongly. And that therefore, we as government owed them the opportunity to say yay or nay, whether this is what they really meant to admit same-sex marriage. And the only way to do it now that you're now now that you're on this side of the coin, the only way to do it is say, do you want to prohibit it, or get government out entirely, or get well, 
Mm-hmm. Which, which actually yeah. was my, in my ignorance, I didn't know that marriage was provided for in the original Constitution. Well, it was, it, it was, it was... Generally, it had been a gener- the purview of the church up at a certain point, and it wasn't. Uh, it actually, I well, didn't know in terms of New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, it was a matter of law going way back, and I forget, certainly back into the 1800s. But you don't see state, well, it's not, it's not really outlined in the Constitution. It's, it, it, they, it rests there under guise of evangelical principles, which carries with it a certain worldview, but is more intently a governmental philosophy. My only argument was where prior to 1968, same-sex ma- marriage clearly would have been prohibited. That when it was, when that clause or, or word was removed or, or emasculated, became high principles, which means nothing. Nobody has any reference to it. The people did not know, did could not have adequately comprehended what they were admitting at the time. When when they took out evangelical, nobody said, "Oh, good, this means we'll be able to have same-sex marriage." <laughs> I'm sorry, that was not on anybody's radar screen except maybe a handful, if that. I had a professor that it was on his radar screen right. back then. We all laughed at him and thought, who the heck is ever going to want that? Right. But the people who were, the people who were approving that amendment would never have had that on their radar, radar screen. Therefore, we owed them, as government, the opportunity to say a specific yay or nay. So from a, from a purely pragmatic point of view, given the state that things have worked themselves into with you know, what we have currently in RSAs, do you, you know, given Article 5, I mean, if, if I look at this and I say, you know, if, if, if I'm, I don't know, Hopi Indian or, or something like that, I, I, I adopt the religion of some Aboriginal tribe in, in Australia and I, you know, I need to go climb Mount Uluru to become designated something or other. Um, there's obviously nothing prohibiting that here. Would it make sense from a purely pragmatic point of view to go about things as, as Tim was alluding to, to sort of disextract the specific religious institution of marriage from anything to do with functionality? And I had a bill in to do that. Yes, I, 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 if we look back historically, there was a relatively intimate relationship between church and state in New Hampshire originally. Over the past 200 years, we have seen a secular secularization of the state. Marriage has always been a particularly religious event. I mean, it's the first religious ceremony in the book of Genesis. It, it pre-exists Judaism in, into uh, Samaria. Okay. It is a religious. It is a religious uh, practice. Sacrament. Uh, sacrament. Thank you. Uh, therefore, I do not believe it is right or proper to be asking permission of the state to execute a religious practice. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to, you know, does the state have certain interests? Sure, it's good for them to know who is and isn't married. If the state has a law prohibiting bigamy, then they know to need to have some way of knowing who the bigamists are, which would be simply a report of the marriage. A marriage has happened. These are the parties. So if one of them wants to take suit in court, well, they could always take suit in church, but if they want to take suit in court, then there is some evidence that such an event has occurred other than the word or dispute by the two parties. So, could I almost think of this as being like a shall issue? Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. A mere record. Okay. A mere record. It is simply a statement of fact. And if you look at our statutes, it's the marriage license that gives you standing in court. But all you really need is a record. This happened. The marriage certificate should be something between the two parties and God and witnessed by the person who performs it. And maybe, if, depending on the practice of the religion, if they're the best man and woman, they would also act as witnesses. That's what they're there for. Would not a definition of the word license be appropriate at this point? You said marriage license. 
Well, does is not a license a privilege given by a corporate government for the party who was a contract with that government to do something that would otherwise be illegal? Notice I use the word illegal, not unlawful. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what a license is. And that's, and that's, I'm very careful, for instance, when I when I describe things like how the Constitution should be presented, what is lawful and what is not. That which is that which is not unlawful is lawful. But what we have is many things that are legal. It's a that fiction. abortion. That well, but things that are legal that would well, yeah, like abortion. Things that are legal that would otherwise be illegal. There are things that are unlawful that we have made legal. Mm -hmm. Vice versa. Hmm? And vice versa. And vice versa. Things that should be lawful that we have made, made illegal. Uh, although I would dispute again and, and as to whether abortion is really legal or not. And there's been a decision in by the judiciary of the United States that says it is not permissible for the states to investigate murder by abortion. That's what it really said. You didn't have to, by English common law, you have an absolute right to privacy. The Constitution, remember, what is the Constitution? The Constitution is the permit slip for government. The con you have an absolute right to privacy. And then, well, let, okay, this is a good place to jump back into class. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Let's look at Article, I think it's three. No, yeah. Article three. When men enter into a state of society, they surrender up some of their natural rights to that society in order to ensure the, protect, ensure the protection of others. And without such equivalent, the surrender is void. What are we surrendering? Well, if you have an absolute right to privacy, but you want to be protected in your person and property, that means crimes have to be investigated. So you surrender a portion of that absolute right to privacy such that when there is a probable cause that a crime has been committed, the government has the power to investigate, the right to investigate the crime. And then only with very, in, within very narrow terms, so you've surrendered up a portion of your inherent natural rights of privacy. So if a state, and it was since 1854 where there was law in the books until 1998, that abortion was murder and that the physician who performed, uh, terminated the pregnancy of a quick child would be guilty of a fine of $10,000. Was that that public policy? I wasn't. Public policy well, well, is two different things. That, that was, that Public was, policy is that was established a matter, by a democracy. That was a matter of law. Okay? It was a crime to commit a, an abortion. What Roe versus Wade said was you couldn't investigate it because of this newfound right of privacy, which was always there. They said you can't investigate, even by probable cause. A woman went in pregnant, she came out not pregnant. Something happened. Uh, they said you couldn't investigate the crime. That was what they really said in Roe versus Wade. That there was a sudden, sudden new privacy that you couldn't, that you couldn't look in to see what had happened. I wanted to ask about the right of privacy. I think of so many arguments I've had with my brother since he's a lawyer about this notion of a right to privacy. If he goes out reflecting and I say that maybe there is a right to privacy. You know, there's not. Where, where did that come from? Where does no right to privacy come from? The right to privacy. In the English common law. In, yeah, English common law. That that and all Article 90 says that that this Constitution can't void anything that was law before, unless it's repugnant to the Constitution. Well, part of English common law was this extensive right to privacy. So obvious they didn't have to say it. Right. 
But what they did say was that you couldn't investigate it, which is absurd because it says, you know, it's a state. The state has this crime on the books of murder in the case of abortion. Well, if there's probable cause, obviously you surrendered in your constitution that narrow piece of your privacy, that if there is evidence that a crime has been committed, obvious evidence, you have to go before a grand jury for capital uh, crimes, which murder would be, to prove that there is, in fact, a probable cause that the government can then go investigate to see if a crime has been committed and bring charges if appropriate. Well, that's what the grand team. jury did. I was just going to ask. No. But gather evidence to prosecute and decide whether or not there really is sufficient to prosecute. But Article 19 in the New Hampshire legislature, or uh, the Constitution, discusses search and seizures. Right. right. And you can see that it's a very narrow, yeah. very narrow band. You, when, according to the New Hampshire Constitution, you have to say where you're going, why you're going there, who you're going after, and what specifically you're going to look for. <coughs> So if you go in and, you know, I've, they've said, I'm going to, uh, I believe there's something nefarious about people's liberty, so I'm going to uh, look, pick up his copy of the People's Liberty. And they find over on this other table the Communist Manifesto. Can they pick up the Communist Manifesto? No. They can only pick up what they said what the they went there for. Kind of bring this back, I guess, to the, the article we're looking at. It seems like, like Article Two, the bearing of arms, that's an actionable article. You can go to someone and say, "I've been wrong for Article Two. But Article Three is more kind of like a guideline. There's nothing. You can, I can't go to the legislature and go and say, "I've been wrong by Article Three that some of my rights were not given up or something." So, is that how well, the Bill of Rights kind of breaks down? Is there some? I mean, do you, can I get for an overview? Is there some actionable articles and some just kind of guideline articles? I mean, because I can't really do anything with Article 3. I mean, it's um, more of a, like, what should happen. Sure you could. Absolutely, if you have the right of redress. I mean, it's just... But it says that, that, that you have uh, all your natural rights. What if, what if the state had not provided protection of... Okay. Um, it's talking about specificity. I know, but let me, let me... I was thinking about this earlier today in something else I was writing, actually what I was writing today. What if, okay, you have the absolute right to acquire, possess, and protect property. And the state allows the town to come in and sell your property for non-payment of taxes and walk away with the balance and you get nada. That's called theft. That's called theft. <laughs> They have not protected your right to acquire, possess, and protect property. Mm -hmm. and that's you have a right to go and lodge a petition for redress of grievance with the legislature, in which that would be heard. And are there cases of this happening? Yes. Uh, it's, a, it's a convoluted case, but I know of a family that has been aggressed upon by DCYF, and in part of it, yeah. uh, Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Um, Corporate creation. They they went after this family. Now, the woman had lost control of her children. She met a new man. He came in. Through some stretch, I don't know what, they took his son away. And... When his father died, his mother put him on the deed to the house. Somehow, he was kicked out of the house. Now, this is where I'm getting fuzzy. But the long and short of it was, at the end of the day, his mother had to be put into a nursing home, and they forced the sale of his house, which wouldn't have been possible if he hadn't been put on the deed, to pay for the nursing home. And this was all done by our judiciary. Thank you. Although by corporate government, not your constitutional government. Dan, could I have a minute to... No. You have, no, 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 I mean, I want to... You've got a gift for him, i got a no. gift for him. 
Well, I'm sure it. Okay. Sure it. Yeah, because these are all of the amendments to your Constitution. I hope I got enough for you. Okay, well, while those are being passed out, let me throw another scenario at you with this uh, Article 3 concerning property. <laughs> Suppose so you have a natural There have property. been amendments made. <laughs> I, I've got some property. I've got a big, you know, big lot out somewhere. Mm -hmm. And well, I decide sure. to put this property to profitable use. So I start. Is a good time for Yeah, let's have a break. Okay. Feel free to move about, stretch your legs. I start growing some hemp.